Yeah, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm kind of surprised. Oh, my God. Uh, nothing interesting in the other talks. Um, yeah, welcome. And because there are so many of you, I question who of you knows what architecture cutters are? Okay, who of you is just here because they're interested in knowing what architecture cutters are? Okay, I hope you won't be disappointed. Um, very short introduction, my name is Frank. Um, I'm freelancing as a coach, developer, consultant, whatever you want to call it, for three and a half years. Uh, my main focus is on code quality, and this includes architecture, because if the architecture is broken, then you can have the best code coding style guide, and it will still be a mess. And um, Architecture cutters are actually my favorite workshop, so I love talking about them, and I love presenting them. If you have any feedback, constructive, bad, whatever, and also maybe you liked it, you can follow me on Twitter and leave some comment, because if you tell me what I can do better next time, I can improve. Um, if you're seen with the Moin, I'm from Hamburg. And I also run the PHP user group in Hamburg, so if you are in Hamburg around sometime, feel free to come by, and you're always welcome. So much for introduction. Uh, I want to talk about two things. First of all, there is a problem with our architecture planning and architectures in general, and then I will talk about if architecture cutters can maybe help solving or at least delegating the problem. Normally, and that may be the disclaimer up front, uh, at conferences when people talk about architecture, it's about design patterns, about technical stuff. I will not talk about technical stuff. I will not talk about design patterns. And it's always interesting when I do the workshop at a company where people don't know what to expect. They come with a laptop and sit in the room and expect that we'll do hard coding and everything. And then we have a two-day workshop without laptop at all. So this is not about technical stuff. It's more about how, to, how do you get from requirements to the technical stuff. About the problem. It was scary. Um, I can hear myself. It's kind of creepy. What is software architecture? Normally, I would ask the question to the people I do the workshop with, and Martin Fowler has a really nice description or definition of software architecture because software architecture is those decisions that are hard to change. These are the decisions we take in the beginning when we start planning our new software. These are the fundamental decisions we will have later on. If these are based on wrong information, on missing information, we will have a hard time changing them later. You probably all have worked with legacy code where you say, okay, damn it, this is completely not what I would do it if I would do it again because now I have more information, I would do it differently, and I know what to expect. But in the beginning, you take assumptions, you start coding, and then you make decisions that turn out later that are wrong, based on wrong information or missing information. And these are very hard to change because everything else is based on these uh, first decisions. I'll let you read this because probably most of you know at least the situation. It's easy to find out when people are finished because the people start laughing. Who of you has worked with customers like that, more or less? I mean, they most of the time they don't really know what they want later on as well. They just assume that you can help them getting there somehow and uh, you can help them figuring out what they really want. So, yeah, we are stuck. We have to assign a software for a problem the customer don't even know what the real problem is. And then we want to have a good architecture and a good, quad, good, a good code quality for the software where we don't know the problem for. Kind of complicated. So my favorite saying and my sadly typical experience is weeks of coding can save you hours of planning. I've been in so many teams and so many companies where people say, okay, we don't have time, we have a deadline. 
we have so much pressure. We need to get working on it because the customer is waiting for that. We cannot wait. We cannot waste time and planning and thinking about all the stuff. We have to start somewhere because we also have a huge team in the background sitting, sitting around and waiting to do something. So can we, can we just start coding? I mean, let's start and let's start somewhere and then we go ahead and we'll figure out the rest while we do that. My experience and my belief is if you spend a little bit more time in the beginning thinking about the problem and trying to figure out the problem, it will save you a, long, a lot of time later on. Who of you has been in a situation where you coded something and maybe two months later you've been there, oh, damn it, if I would have known that in the first place, I would have done differently. Yeah. Who of you will do it again after that? Oh, there are some. Yeah, but in most situations you can do it. You've raised it two months. You've created something. There is something there. And you start yeah, working around with that and trying to figure out how you can use the stuff you created already to solve the problem you now discovered. If you would have spent some time in the beginning trying to figure out the problem, getting the information first, then it would have been probably better. And we get to that. Who of you is working Agile, more or less? Who of you knows the Agile Manifesto? Oh, okay, that's good. So, I mean, Agile, we are planning. What, what is he talking about? I don't, we don't want to plan. Responding to change over following a plan. We want, to, we want to be flexible, right? So we don't want to spend time planning. That's waterfall, isn't it? Like wasting time in the beginning to figure out what we want to do. That's the stuff we left behind. Who of you knows the 12 principles behind the Agile Manifesto? There's a second page to the Agile Manifesto, and this is actually maybe more important than the first page. And they have 12 principles that are behind these things. And responding to change over following a plan does not mean you shouldn't have a plan. It doesn't mean responding to change and forget the plan. It just says responding to changes is more important than having a plan or following or sticking to the plan. But we should have maybe a little bit. And also, if you're really agile, these are two of the 12 principles behind that. Business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. Who of you is doing that daily with a customer? Okay, before, now we have like 5%, before we had like 90% saying they're working, working agile. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. So we want a face-to-face -face conversation with our customer daily. Who of you is doing that? But if you're not doing this, because this is really the idea how you can respond to change, because the customer, the business partner is noticing, seeing, discussing every change every day with you. So then you can be flexible. If you cannot do this, and there are a lot of reasons why you cannot do this, maybe the customer is remote, they, they hired you to do their stuff because they don't want to be bothered with it in the first place. So maybe there's a different department. They have all the other stuff to do as well. It's not their job to sit there helping developers. So there are very valid reasons why this won't happen. But if you don't do this, you have a hard time having a constant change, a constant discussion about what's going on. So if you can't do this, you should at least plan a little bit. But okay, so if agile is not really a solution and we're having a hard time being really agile, we probably need a plan and we still have problems with that. Maybe more experience would work. Frederick Brooks, not Junior anymore. Who knows the name? Okay, you're, you're first row for a reason. Um, he wrote another very famous book, Mythical Men Month. Who has heard of that, maybe? A couple more. Read it. Everybody who hasn't heard it, it's from 1975. I will quote it later again. It's from 1975. Read it. It's perfect. It's really good. And in 2010, he wrote a new book. I have the cover in the slides as well. This, sadly, only the German version. Uh, in English, it's Design of Design. In German, it's Erfolgreiches Design. He's not only talking about software design, but also about um, building a house and uh, stuff like that. And in the book, he's asking, okay, how do we get, get great designers? He's talking about how, to, how do we get to great design, but he discovers, okay, great designers design. 
They have a lot of experience doing design and making a lot of mistakes and getting better and better and better. So they know how to think out of the box and how to come up with great solutions. Like the first iPhone, like only having one button, it's, from design perspective, was a great idea. And nobody else was thinking about that. All other phones before that were adding more buttons to add more stuff instead of removing more buttons. Okay, more experience. That's nice. And I mean, okay, there's the book. And the greatest teacher is failure. Uh, failure is, sorry. And I believe this as well. I mean, those people who have more experience and are really good at something fail a lot of times to know what to avoid, what to do, and how to get better. Sounds simple. Um, as I said, the book came out in 2010. In 2012, Ted Nuak was at, I'm not sure if it was a JAX or some other conference. I think it was a conference in the uh, US. He thought, okay, if great designers get better if they design more, what about software architects? How are we supposed to get great architects if they only get a chance to architect fewer than a half dozen times in their career? He's talking about big designs, not like smaller designs, but really big designs where the project will last a couple of many years or something in development time. And my experience as well, if you have young developers that are not really involved in the architecture process, then maybe once they get to senior level, they start doing architecture stuff. They do it a couple of times. They make a couple of mistakes. And once they get better, they may be promoted to team lead, CTO, or whatever, and they don't do it anymore. So as soon as they get better, better at that job, they're not doing it anymore. And do we really want to fail at that point? I mean, these are all custom customer projects. We don't want to put our senior developers into a situation where we have a customer who is waiting for a project and please learn with failing. I don't think the customer will be happy about that. So Ted Neuer came up with the idea, okay, can is there a way to maybe train that, get into a situation that we have people there are people in a situation where they can train and fail without a risk that we lose a customer. The idea of an architecture cutter was born. Who of you have heard about code cutters? Okay, a bit more. For those who don't know that, I will give a small explanation about cutters in a minute because now we're talking about architectures cut, uh, architecture cutters and how they can solve this problem. Like we don't have enough experience and we are not really... Yeah, our experience for planning and getting to a solution, to an architecture solution is really, yeah, we don't have so much experience with that, most of the people. What is a cutter? The idea comes from martial arts, from karate. It's an exercise where you repeat a form many, many times, making little improvement in each. Probably the most famous code cutter is fist bus. It's a very bad example because it's used for, or was used a lot for hiring stuff and interviewing people. It's like you count from 1 to 100 and every number you can divide by 3, you print out fists. Every number you divide, you can divide by 5, you print out bus. And if you can divide it by 3 and 5, you print out fist bus. There's a website with more than 100 solutions for any language you can think of. So there are a lot of solutions for this simple problem and people use this in a, an interview process to figure out if people can at least start programming right away or if they are just already having problems with a simple problem like this. Another very famous code cutter is a bowling game where you just program a software where you enter the pins you bowled and then the software will calculate how many points you get. Code cutters are very, very simple problems which you can solve in like 20 minutes, half an hour, one hour, and iterate with new solutions, new ideas, and maybe come up with new solutions and trying to learn from that all the time. Maybe sometimes you're using dependency injection, the next time you are avoiding dependency injection, just to see what will that make to your code, how the code will change, what the, um, what the code will look like if you do this. An architecture cutter is taking this to another level, not about smaller, still small problems, small scale problems, but not on the coding base, but on like the planning, the architecture phase. And while code cutters take like, as I said, between 20 to minutes to one hour, architecture cutters take most of the time at least one hour, maybe two hours, but not more. 
the basic idea is they are manageable in size and duration, so you're not wasting like weeks of, uh, pro uh, of planning and uh, doing stuff, but really only a short time. You don't need to come up with a perfect solution. The whole idea is not about getting a perfect solution. The whole idea is about training the process, getting better, getting new ideas how to do that. And make mistakes, to fail, to learn from these failings in a safe environment where no customer will be unhappy or angry if you fail the project or come up with a non-perfect solution. On the other way around, you maybe want to come up with a non-perfect solution to see, okay, how will the architecture look like if I try something that I would never do in a real-life environment? Because then you can learn from that. And you would never want to do that with a real customer. And a very important point is you do this with multiple groups and you get feedback from each group. So you have feedback from your peers, from other people who can give you their learnings and tell you what they can improve. And it can be harsh because you're running in a situation where you must be prepared to fail. And as I said before, it's not about finding a great solution, getting, coming up with a great architecture, but iterating, failing, learning how to get better in this process so you can get better when it really comes up in a real environment, in a real project. The idea from TechNewart itself, there are two scenarios. The first one is what TechNewart um, explains on his website and how he came up. The other one is from my experience. Both have like three to five people in a group. My perfect size of a group is three people because then you have a lot of discussions. With four people, it's still okay. With five people in a group, you very often have at least one person who is not involved in a discussion, maybe sits in, the, uh, in a chair and is tired and looks at his uh, mobile phone and isn't paying attention. So it's very, very often happens that people are not that involved with a five-people group. Three people, you have a hard time trying to get not involved because you only have three people. You are always involved. Um, he says four to ten groups. You can do this if you have like a conference set up where you want to do a workshop with a lot of groups and split them up over a whole uh, a big room and just let them figure out stuff. I prefer a maximum of three groups because we get to the rules later. I will be the facilitator. I will answer questions for all these groups and typically I want to teach them specific things with each, each cutter. Maybe trying to figure out requirements, maybe trying to get more technical. But I will be the bottleneck because they will ask me questions. If I have more than three groups, for example, we have five groups and I need 10 minutes for each group, the last group is waiting 40 minutes to me, for me to arrive there. So more groups means I will be a huge bottleneck. I would do the first one for user groups or for scenarios like this where we just want to introduce the idea and have a lot of fun. If I want to, have do, if I do a two, like two-day training at a customer and they want to train this in more detail, I will say three people, three groups is the perfect size. The other difference is that if, if you're in a bigger room or with multiple groups, you can have different cutters, different projects for each group. So when they later on compare their ideas, the solutions, it's new for every group. With a smaller size, like three groups, I will use the same project, the same cutter, so they can more get more into the detail and more on the problems the other group had. So we're uh, discussing on the same level and don't have to figure out the whole situation when the group presents their idea. Both are fine. I would choose which way I will do it depending on the location, depending on the situation and where I am. As I said, for conferences, for big groups, for introducing this, I would use as much groups as possible to introduce to more people. If I do it as a customer, I would say, okay, make it a smaller group so people can get more out of that. And I have more time to talk to people. How does it work? Very, very simple. I will give you a, a real example of an architecture cutter in a minute. So I just want to make you sure you understand how the process works. You have an introduction, like I will introduce the architecture cutter, we'll present it to everyone, ask if they have any um, problems understanding the idea behind that, not talking about problems in the project itself in the cutter, but in general, do you have any understanding problems? Is it clear for everybody? Then we have the planning phase. As I said, one hour to two hours for the teams where they can really get whiteboards, use whatever they want. I prefer whiteboards for a reason. 
and they can just plan and try to get from these small cutter, which is just written text, to an architecture version. Then we have the presentation where each group presents their solution. The idea is to come up with an architecture vision, not the real solution. They don't have to pro program anything. In a lot of time, a lot of times, in a lot of cases, it's really hard to even come up with a vision within two hours. I've seen teams failing. They have like two hours and they don't even get the requirements clearly communicated within two hours because it's so... We're not used to do that, and it's really hard if you have unclear requirements and you have to figure out the requirements and come up with an architecture solution. If you have never done that or not that often, it's really hard. And then you get feedback from all the other people, the other groups. I give feedback as well, obviously, as a trainer, but the main idea is that they give feedback to each other and figure out, talking to each other, what went good, how can they improve, and later on I will give more ideas how they can improve. The rules look like a lot, uh, isn't really much. I will go through them very fast. You can ask me as an instructor or facilitator any question you want. I have to come up with solutions, with answers. Like, as I said, I will be more or less everybody, the team, the, uh, the, the team who is doing the cutter is not. Like, if they are the development team, I will be the customer, I will be the project manager, I will be the next department on the, uh, the next door. Anybody they can think of where the question for, I will be the one who has to answer the question, which can be quite fun because I can kind of steer how hard I want to make it for them. But sometimes they come up with questions I never thought about and then I have to make something up on the spot. They must be prepared to present their idea later on and defend the questions. So if you have questions about that, they must defend it. It's very small, but the imp very important part of this. And they must be prepared to ask questions to the other teams. So don't just sit there and wait for the other team to present their idea and say, yeah, looks nice. But really try and you want, you want to get better, so you have to try to figure out what can be improved. You can make safely assumptions about technologies you don't know well. Um, this means if you don't know if this technology can really do this or solve this problem, as long as it's okay and you can define it, you can do this. The funny part is these technical stuff are not really used a lot because it's not about technical solutions. It's more about figuring out what the problem is and then the technical solution should just fit to the problem. You may not assume you have hiring and firing authority, something I haven't really had problems with in my workshops so far. But it's interesting because some people may say, okay, if we just hire 20 developers and then we can do this easily. And we hire the best people for Go or whatever, and then they can do all the stuff we think of. Especially when I introduce like deadlines and say, okay, you, uh, your project is, uh, has a deadline in two months, okay, come up with a solution you can, um, yeah, you can create in two months. So I can introduce limits, and then they come up, our work. we just hire another 20 developers, and then we can do this easily. And no, you have to come up with a solution that fits in the time frame and within your normal team. Any technology is fair game, you must justify it. Again, my experience is when people start talking about technology during these cutters very early on, there's a problem. Because they are already talking about which technology they want to use, but they still haven't understood the problem. So they are they said, okay, they've decided on the technology and now they just have to fit the problem into the technology and not the other way around. And if anybody has any other questions about rules, they can always ask about that. I said all this hiring and technology stuff is usually not really used at all. The main important things are the presentation, asking questions in the presentations, and asking me anything you want during a workshop. Okay, now we'll see how a cutter looks like. This is one of our favorite cutters because it's very simple. And this is all the teams get. I will read it, or I think you're reading it, so I'm just waiting for a moment.
this, this example is taken from the website from Tech New York. Here's a, like a randomized uh, architecture cutter generator. You can press a button and you get a randomized uh, random um, architecture cutter, which is quite interesting if you're just doing this in your team and do it a couple of times. Some of them are really tough. Some of them I haven't even tried yet um, because I, had, I, have, my, I myself don't have any idea how to solve them. They are very complex. This is, looks very, very easy. There are a couple of things in there I would kind of spoil for you um, that make this very nice as a starting cutter. First of all, you might notice that users unsure whatever the local music community is. There's a lot of stuff that's not really well-defined. This helps me as a facilitator. I can use this to change the scope of the whole um, cutter, to make it bigger, to make it smaller, to make it harder, to make it easier. But in general, this sounds really simple. I mean, they want more. They want to connect to their uh, audience. They want to have a wish list. But coming up, what exactly is wanted here? There's a wish list. There's okay. What is the voting system? What about the wish list? Um, do people need to log in to add a wish? What about the wish list in general? Can they add free text? Is there a database behind that? Um, what kind of connection might we have or need to the radio station? There's a lot of stuff hidden here that people need to figure out by themselves because typical the customer will just tell them we want this and they have no clue what I can I think meanwhile I can play a pretty dumb customer pretty good so I can just whenever uh, developers ask me do you want this do you need this and I would say oh yes that sounds good I want that if they if they come up with the stuff they want to tell me and ask me if I need that I will always say yes if you if you come up with a good solution and ask me do you want that yes I want that but same cost, same time, and of course, as you promoted this, it shouldn't be any effort, right? So um, this is quite easy. There are other scenarios I really like because they really focus on if you ask the wrong questions, customers will always say yes, and they are really happy that you tell them what what else you can do, what, what sounds good. What I try to teach the developers all the time is if you need to come up with... Um, decision. And very often we have to. We have to decide which way we go. Do we invest more into the architecture? Do we make a simple architecture? These all have consequences on the business side. Because maybe the, developer, the, the customer later on wants to add more to this whole website, to the whole application. Maybe he has some, some ideas in the back of his head or in, the, in his desk and he's thinking if this works out well, we can maybe add more stuff to it later. Maybe he won't tell you because he doesn't think it's important for you. But if you ask him, are you planning to add more stuff to this later? Then you maybe can create an architecture that will not do this yet, but is prepared to do this later on. If you don't ask him and you think, yeah, he will not do this because it's not in the requirements, you may build an architecture that will have a huge problem as soon as the customer says, oh, this worked out well, now we want to add like a new feature for our customers. And you say, okay, that was never planned. Our architecture cannot do this. This is where the decisions at the beginning can really have a huge impact. And the funny part is, because I know this cutter very well, I know exactly what questions I expect, what questions they should ask, and how I can play with them if I don't ask the questions. Because then I can have fun. Because then I can later on, when they present the idea, I can ask, wait, did you ask the customer about that? Because that's not what he wanted. In our job as developers or architects, we often have to come up with decisions and what. I want that the developers do is prevent a business owner, if it's the customer, the project manager, and other department, prevent them with um, ideas and what's behind that. Like, we have two options, and you must tell them what the consequences are. We can do it this way. This means we would probably create a faster architecture. We don't waste a lot of time on anything like user-related stuff or user login system. This means they cannot log in, we cannot really track, we might have multiple voting, that's another thing that's hidden in here. What about multiple voting for the same song or same playlist? Or do you want to have a solution where people need to log in? That means we might lose customers, take a lot more time because we have to create a new interface. GDPR is a problem we need to take care of in that situation, but it will enable other stuff. It's not our responsibility and even not our job to take this decision because it's a business-driven decision. But when we ask business partners, 
customers, whatever, do you want it this way or that way? We have to also tell them the consequences and the cost of that. Because if you just ask them, do you want this or that, they have on what base should they uh, decide? They don't know the technical consequences. They don't know maybe is it more effort? Is it take, does it take longer? Does it uh, have any risk involved? Because you just ask them for a decision, you are afraid and you cannot take by yourself. But then you also have to give them the idea what's behind that. And this is something you can train very good with these cutters because I can play the customer and as I'm also a developer, I know what's behind that. And when they come up with and ask me stupid, about stupid ideas, I, as a customer, can say, okay, I will take that. And as a developer, I will tell them, yeah, I will take them and I will kick your ass with that because I know what you're trying to do. Like if you come up with, um, if, they, if they tell me, if, if they want to tell me like, okay, if you don't want to have multiple votings, oh, okay, if you want to, don't want to have multiple votings, this will take another two weeks to implement. As a customer who has no idea about technical stuff, they can try to tell me that. As a developer, I know they're talking bullshit. Because I know there are solutions that are much better than, they, they take like a couple of hours. They're not perfect. The multiple voting stuff, of course, you can do something like people have to log in to vote. Then you can avoid multiple votings as long as they don't use multiple accounts. You also lose a lot of customers because not everybody wants to log in to vote on a song. But what about maybe, yeah, if you're checking for IP addresses, if you have to store them, you have to check, okay, what are we doing with GDPR? Cookies, same, we have to have a cookie warning. But these might also just disable the multi-voting uh, stuff. But then you have to also disable uh, the voting because if the, uh, the, the cookies, because if the voting is for each song that's being played, that means the next song should be being voted again. The user should be able to vote on the next song again. So the cookie needs to be disabled. Then you have, can you have a discussion with the customer if it's really worth all this effort, all the solutions to just disable this, or if you maybe just want to start without having this disabled. You need to make clear all the consequences, all the cost of these decisions. You cannot just ask, do you want to disable this or don't you, don't you want to disable it? Do you want cookies or don't you want cookies? Talk about the consequences, the cost, and the ideas behind that, because then he can make a well-decided and well-informed business decision, because that's his job, not ours. There are, I think, about 20 to 30 cutters on this website. Um, you can come up with your own cutters very easily if you take examples from your daily life. Um, some of them are very technical. I've seen people doing this cutter in one hour, and after one hour they were talking about the database table structure. They were finished, more or less. These were very experienced people. One of them was an ex-colleague of mine who was lead for the quality department. Another one was a CTO. They have done this a lot of times in their career. They were really flying through this and doing this easily. I've seen other people, after one hour, they were still not sure about what they want to do. Because when you're not used to do this, this like this like a story we get. It's a little bit more or less structured than uh, if you get a real customer requirement. But typically, we get a customer, maybe we get a user story from a customer, and then we have to figure out how we, can we translate this text to an architecture, to code. Maybe most of you know this big picture where you have some planning there, and there's a big bubble in the middle, and the magic happens here. Like this transformation from text to code. This is something, okay, how do we do this? How do we get from text, from non-complete requirements to code to architecture? And this is the hard part. As I said in the beginning, most architecture talks talk about design patterns and how what our architecture patterns we have, CQRS, MVC, and so on. This is the technical part. This is kind of easy. We can train that. There are a lot of documentation about that. But how do we get from here to a CQRS architecture? Can we even be sure if CQRS, for example, is the right architecture for this? We don't know. How can we figure this out? And this is what an architecture cutter workshop for me is all about. Learning this process. How do I get from incomplete, kind of, yeah, not so clearly defined requirements to an architecture? And that can be trained. The funny part is if I do this, I will show some pictures later. If I do this as a two-day workshop, that means typically four cutters, two for each day. In the beginning, the first time they use whiteboards because whiteboards are easy to wipe away some stuff. 
they write they write a lot of text. They try to def rewrite the requirements in Prosa in text again. And this is very hard because text is not so clearly defined a lot of times and you just want to rewrite it. And they have a hard time with just this example to even get to the point where they figure out the requirements. Then you introduce some more stuff. Like diagrams are very useful. I will show an example for another diagram later on. Um, like UML use case diagrams. Very, very simple. And I really don't care about UML syntax if the error is correct, if it's filled out, if it's grayed out, it, whatever, I don't care. But as a communication tool to communicate ideas and to write down requirements, every use case, I can use this and write down use cases with like the sticky man. I can just start writing and painting them down immediately. I have, what users do I have? I have a DJ, I have audience. And maybe that's it. That's all my use users I have for this so far. Then I have a couple of use cases. They want to vote. They want to request songs. They want to uh, vote on the songs playing right now. They want to vote on the DJ's daily playing list. These are the use cases I can see clearly just in the beginning. Then I can figure out, okay, do I have some more use cases? Are there any use cases that are more in between the lines? But if I use this, instead of trying to write down this as another text, it's much more easier to concentrate and move forward. And then also, if I have these use cases written down as a maybe UML diagram, I can also figure out, okay, these are my APIs because these are all my requests I need later on my system. There need to be a way that the, they can request songs. There need to be an API for voting on the song that's being played and voting on the playlist. Obviously, there need to be a way to show the playlist and everything as well. These are the things that are kind of hidden in there, but they are obvious. So you can train the way, how can I easily get from the information, how can I transform that into a diagram, and how can they use these diagrams to transform this into an API and maybe an architecture. I think about maybe probably even about multiple domains later on. This is a very easy example where you can get, but you don't need to get into like domain-driven stuff. There's other, also another important thing. I talked about this book, Mythe Gemenmans, uh, in the beginning. And there's one chapter, Plan to Throw One Away. As I said, the book is from 1975. It's very, very old. And he has created like the IBM uh, 360 operating system. He was, for the, uh, he was one of the leading architects for that. And he said, the first version of everything we create is shit. Plan to throw it away. Because you will know, better, uh, how, you will know how to do better after you've done it. That's where rapid prototyping everything comes in. And who, who of you has been in a project where they say, yeah, we just need to create the first version after it was rolled away and do it again? Who did that? Good for those who did it, but most of the time, because it's there and it's running and it's working, so why should we throw it away? It's nearly perfect. We just need to add a couple of new features for that. Shouldn't be too hard. So is that plan to throw one away? It's a nice idea and it should work. And it will always be better if you do it again. But for me, the most important part that architectures can teach you, I, don't, I want the teams that I work with not to throw the first version away, but the first three or four versions. Because every version they get after it is much better than the first version would have been. But if they do this on a whiteboard, it's very cost-free. Well, not free, but cost-efficient. Because if I can plan the first three versions of the whiteboard and figure out what is wrong with these versions. Wipe them away and start again. That cost me a couple of hours, maybe days. But it's much, much faster than implementing and then figuring out that you should sure throw it away and start again. That's why I love whiteboards. In a whiteboard, you can wipe stuff away. If you figure out this part of the architecture is not good, I wipe it away and try again. I've done this workshop a couple of times, even for the IPC Munich last year, and then, okay, we don't have whiteboards, can we use flip charts? Have you ever tried to correct something on a flip chart? You've written the whole flip chart, and then you, there's some corner of the flip chart is wrong. What do you do? Do you turn over? Uh, you won't right away. You don't turn over and start again. You will try to erase it and try to make errors like you have workarounds. That's the same that happens in code after you've written for two months. You won't throw it away. You will start with workarounds. So flip chart is for me a perfect example for what will happen in the code if you are not able to raise it easily. 
I had workshops where customers said, ah, we don't have flip charts, we do it with stickies, and fl uh, we don't have whiteboards, we do it f uh, with flip charts and something. They figured out during the workshop that it's really a bad idea, and they had like one whiteboard, so one group was using a whiteboard, the others w uh, couldn't. That group had a lot of fun, the other groups were a little bit frustrated about the tooling, and afterwards they ordered a couple of flip charts, uh, I think like a lorry full of flip charts. For me, it was the best outcome for WordCamp ever. Our workshop. They ordered, I think, three to four flip charts per developer office. Perfect. A whiteboard, sorry. Um, because for planning, if, if I come into companies and go to a meeting room for developers and there's no whiteboard available, or maybe there's one whiteboard where all the postcards are sticked on or something, how do they do planning? How do they plan anything? I know I couldn't. I would not be able to. So whiteboards are a very important tool for planning because you can wipe stuff away. doesn't mean the flip charts and sticky notes aren't useful for other things. I will show a little bit later as well. But whiteboards are very important for me, for planning, because I can stand there, draw some stuff, show, talk to other people on that, have a discussion, wipe it away. Um, I also said diagrams can help. There's the one diagram method I want to mention at least, uh, because UML, probably everybody knows that one. A lot of people hate UML for obvious reasons. UML has, I don't know, the current situation, 16, 15 diagram, diagram types, I don't know. Um, there was a huge rant, I forgot the name, damn it, of the one who invented this model. Uh, he wrote a rant about UML, like you only have to use a couple of these diagram types, like use case, class diagram, maybe component diagram, activity diagram, all the other types you rarely use, and I agree to that. I've learned UML maybe 20 years ago, and I have a hard time remembering anything besides these four that I ever used in a practical environment. But use cases are very useful. Class diagrams can be very useful, and components diagrams, depending on the size of your architecture, can be very useful as well. A couple of years later, he came up with an idea with C4. It's uh, c4model.org. All the links are in the slides later on. I'll put them online, and we can access them via the login from the conference. The idea behind C4 was like Google Maps, you can zoom in. This is just a um, picture out of the middle, out of the container um, area. It was called C4 because he called the highest level context. The names have been changed a little bit, but it's still called C4. Context, then containers. Uh, oh, let me check. No, wait. Com uh, containers, components, and classes. And the idea was like you are on the highest level, and then you can zoom into the next level, zoom into the next level, and zoom into the lowest level with the code, with the classes. I learned this one. I was doing uh, this workshop um, for architecture cutters at the Socrates, and we were doing this in a room, and one guy came in and looked at the architecture cutter, and he didn't use architecture cutters, but he, oh, this this cool. Let me help. Let me uh, join you. And he started drawing these kind of pictures. And really, he drew the main the, the highest level, which is kind of like a use case, but more focus on what uh, context do we have, what kind of applications do we have, and then zoomed into the next one, picked out one of them, zoomed in, and started writing there. For me, this was an eye-opener, because a lot of times when you have discussions with developers about architecture, you get lost in details. You're talking about a lot of details on the lowest level while figuring out how to plan your architecture on the highest level. But we have to take care of this special case. Yes, we have, but not on the highest level. We need to make sure that we can solve it down somewhere, but we don't need to figure out how to solve it yet when, while we try to figure out maybe what kind of services we need. You know, one of the services need to figure out this problem, need to solve the problem, but while we're talking about the services, we don't need to talk about the special case. Developers do this all, all the time, a lot of times, because they're trying to wrap around all the information they need in their head, and it's very important. This type of diagram helped me and the other people a lot to try to focus on what level are we currently. Are we on the context level? Are we on the container level? Are we on the class level? So we can figure out, do we need to talk about this problem on this level, yes or no? It's very easy to put the finger, okay, we are on this level, we don't need to talk about this yet. It would be worth probably to make a whole talk about just this uh, thing because it's much easier than UML and it's very, very useful. As I said, c4model.org. It has nothing to do with a bomb, so you're safe for that. And it's very useful. 
this was all like the kind of slides I have. A quick introduction. I will show you some pictures from a real workshop I did like two weeks, three weeks ago in Saarbrücken. And the one who invited me is actually doing a talk right now as well. And uh, yeah, I was giving a talk about a different topic last year in Munich and he just noticed, uh, heard about architecture cutters and they, he said, okay, this sounds cool. You have to come over and do a workshop with us. And the pictures are pretty dark because of a dark room. So if you can't see the, all the details, it's okay. It just gives you an impression. They got two side up uh, whiteboards because the hotel where we were didn't have any real whiteboards. So it was kind of limited and they were only one sided. On the other side was like where you could put needles in. And it was very easy to figure out okay, like this is two halves of whiteboard and not e even in the lengths, but only very high is the bare minimum you need for planning. They wiped away during one session or during one cutter the whiteboards a couple of times because they were running out of space. The best situation is if you have two large whiteboards double-sided, that will be enough for one cutter because you need a lot of space and writing stuff down. This, these are pictures are all from the presentation phase later on where they presented their solution to the other people. It's just to give you an impression. Um, they have multiple groups. They were, you can barely see there are some diagrams already. I didn't take pictures from the first phase because there were no diagrams, nothing at all. It was just pure text for all of the groups. So it was a huge difference. Later on, uh, on the second day, the last cutter, there was barely any te text at all. They were really having architecture visions as diagrams, while the first cutter was only text. They didn't really come up with anything at all. You can see it's... I mean, obviously, these things are not very beautiful. I mean, I cannot really, I'm not great with painting or some stuff as well. My diagrams are not beautiful as well if I draw them on a whiteboard. But if you're standing on a whiteboard with a couple of people or some person explaining this to you, this is more than enough to understand what they were thinking about. And this is much easier to explain a diagram like this than having a lot of text on there and trying to explain the text again. So a diagram can be much more clearly uh, communicated to other developers, to customers, and trying to figure out, did we get all the use cases, did we forget anything, or is this idea working? Can we, if you have use cases before and then have an architecture version, you can use the use cases to play through the architecture. Do they work out? Does this work? You can see a little bit more. This was like, uh, I think we called it Loki because of, what was it? In the English is called Where's Kitty. It's like a, you have to come up with a system to where people can post online. They lost the pet and they want to find the kitty again and everything. Um, I don't know what we, why we called it Loki. I forgot it. So here they made a couple of like uh, a tear halter, like the pet holder. Uh, this is the finder who found the pet. And then you have multiple use cases where they can say, okay, I found your pet and now I get a reward and payment is involved in everything. So they just draw the use cases. And then came up later on the, on the bottom with some trying to come up with like an architecture out of that. So we're going step by step. As I said, it's not beautiful, but it helps. On the left side, they were trying with like uh, what kind of types do we have, what kind of um, uh, uh, attributes we need for these types. We talked about this later because this was going in a little bit wrong direction, but it was still okay, and it helped them understanding the problem. Yeah, here's just some more pictures from the solutions. The last thing I want to talk about, because we're a little bit over the time, is event storming. Um, event storming is a great tool, and this is the tool you can use with sticky notes. Um, I think Anna, PHP 16, they talked about this a lot of times as well. It's my second favorite workshop I do. It's very great if you want to figure out the requirements, and you can combine, combine this actually with architecture cutters, with a random example. It's a little bit harder because for event storming, you need business people more than developers because they know what the domain, what the business is supposed to do. This is a very great tool to understand the requirements. So it can be part of using this to understand your requirements and beginning and come up with really that everybody's on the same page and everybody knows what they're doing. And architecture cutters can be used to train this as well because yeah, for training, I use a random, made, a random example. But this solves a lot of the problems we have with understanding requirements. So take a look at event storming. If you don't know it yet, it's very great as well. And I think that's it.
and I hope you learn a little bit more about it. I checked your cutters and are not, are not too disappointed. Thank you. Any? I don't know if we have time for questions or feedback. Um, if we have some time for that, quickly. Otherwise, come to me later. I don't know. Do we have time for some questions or maybe two questions or so, if, if, if there are any at all? Are there any questions? Okay, then if you have any questions, otherwise come to me and talk to me. I um, will be here today uh, until around 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.